Can you hear me all right, or do I need a mic? Okay, I'll try and speak up. And I'll skip the face shield since you guys don't have one. And I'm not going to start with square piece. I brought this just to show you. This is a piece I would typically work with, although when I first started doing these, I was working mostly from scrap logs I had laying around the basement that weren't big enough for bowls and were getting ready to start cracking and such. Sometimes when you start working with faulty materials, you Wayne Martin would call maybe a dilapidated birdhouse. <laughs> but this was green and had a crack to begin with, and even with CA it continued cracking. This was punky enough to where it just crumbled and flew off. So hopefully we won't have anything flying today. What kind of wood is that, Bob? The bottom, I believe, is spalted sweet gum, which is what I'm going to turn the roof from today. And this, I think, was Bradford pear, but I won't swear to it. But it has a major crack and looks like it's developed another small crack. I'm like Jerry's answer being a crack house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I've got some hand dabs here, which we can pass around. I think there's enough. If not, in fact, I've still got more up here. So I will be basically following this in the presentation to give you some idea of what I'm doing. Across the top are pictures of the ornaments I did one year. Most everyone in my family wound up with a birdhouse ornament that Christmas. Oh. So shape is subjective, whatever appeals to you. Some of them wound up tall and skinny. Some of them wound up squatty and fat. It depended upon the piece of wood I had available. Um, the drawing on the back is what I considered optimum, and those two over there are fairly close to these dimensions. But the one that Heather has hanging up outside is a tall and skinny one. So whatever you have available, there are no rules. There's no laws. Um, it's magic. Sure. You got a you got a two inch square blank with a five inch hole. Did I leave a decimal point <laughs> out? Missing a decimal. <laughs> oh, okay. That's a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> That's a real challenge. Here's what it really looks like after you screw up and. I drilled this on the drill press because if you're starting from square, that's the most convenient. This was supposed to be the bottom of the ornament, and it should have been this way. But when I went to drill the one-inch hole for the cavity, I grabbed it the wrong way, and so that's on the wrong end. So I thought, oh well, target of opportunity. We'll just reverse it, and I'll drill a hole, and I'll put a finial on it. Haven't figured out how to teach the bird to use the perch above the hole. <laughs> but maybe we can put another perch in and plug that hole. But put a light over. <laughs> there you go. But so that actually works in that sort of a house don't use perches. Uh, that may be. I haven't seen any birds that size flitting well, about, a, but a cavity <laughs> nester like that would not do not they don't need a perch. Okay. This one I drilled correctly and I will use this one tonight. A uh, little extra meat on it is always good if you want to do a finial, but you can always attach a finial or do one without a finial. Doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Um, this one here has no finial. Matter of fact, I brought this primarily to show that I hollow the top. And I got the design for these from a guy by the name of Eugene Schlack, who has published in multiple locations on the web his design and his method of making them. I make them a little bit differently than he does, uh, but had to give him credit. So this has no finial, but when you're hollowing, you gotta be careful. Now, I've never hollowed through the side of one, but this one came pretty close. <laughs> so, word to the wise, you can pass that one around, let people get a look at it. Yep, that's a... Good yeah, so when you're drilling, uh, you might not want to get too carried away as far as how deep you go or what size 
spindle gouge you're using to drill it. Uh, I don't bother with regular twist drills. I figure a spindle gouge will do it. Um, okay, what I'm going to do initially is I'm going to face off this blank and I'm going to undercut it because I like my roofs to hang down over the bottom. Um, again, that's subjective. If that's not the style you like, you don't have to do that. But it happens to be what I prefer. Okay. It's also six of one, half dozen of the other. Whether you drill it first or whether you face off the bottom first, if you drill it first, then you can use the live center to hold it in place. Now the one thing I did do is I standardized on the size of the tenon used on the uh, joint from the base to the top. By doing that, it just simplified the whole process. going to be running this thing at about 2,500, so that way if it leaves the lathe, it'll leave vigorously. Let's try to make sure it doesn't. Okay, we're ready to go. Oh, I know what's happened. Let's seat it. This will go. Now you could conceivably glue these in with no tenon at all. I happen to like tenons, dados, rabbits, whatever helps locate something when I'm gluing a piece together. So, we will now undercut the bottom. I've actually bored this down about five sixteenths of an inch. As I undercut the bottom, that will be decreased to about an eighth or thereabouts. the same lathe at home but with the extension bed so life is a little bit easier. A little higher than that. Pardon? Okay, so what I'm going to do is drill into this piece, and I think in my handout I probably said drill about an inch and three quarter deep. You don't have to go that deep. The only purpose in drilling this out and hollowing it is to reduce the weight somewhat. Not a big deal. But obviously, as you can see from the one I passed around, if you get carried away, you can get real close to going through the sidewall. That's deep enough. Yeah, we'll let that go. 
this is a little bit crumbly. I don't like the way it drilled, but hopefully it'll hold together. Um, at this point, I'm going to start shaping this, and then I'm going to reverse it. After I've gotten a little bit of the contour done, I'm going to part it off and reverse it onto another chuck. So before I reverse it will be the last chance you have to sign it or apply any finish to the underside, unless you want to do it by hand the hard way. Tail stock. The other reason for hollowing this is it makes it a whole lot easier to get a 60 degree cone in here to support it while you're shaping the outside. And if you're using punky wood, I don't really trust the chuck to hold it. My turning smock. Oh well. Now, one artistic feature I had stumbled upon multiple times by accident is if you inadvertently jam the edge of this, you will frequently get some chatter, which gives you almost a natural edge look, which I kind of like. So, if and when it happens, I leave it. This is my curved skew since I don't handle straight ones very well. use pretty much any spindle gouge you have to do this shaping but unless you're proficient it's a whole lot easier to do this with one of these large roughing gouges. There you go. Now we've got a chattered edge. Now we will go to the smaller. that edge I think we can resort to this one again. But it's a very forgiving tool except for getting started on that edge. thin enough I believe. So what we're gonna do I'm gonna go ahead. I'll even sign it. Stop. Oh we didn't get a very nice chatter. We just got chunks out. Oh well. Okay, um, I use a lot of 
construction finish. Actually, I use a lot of wipe on varnish as well. Um, but I started using pill bottles because I have lots of them. They seem to accumulate every month. And I found out that I could get these squeeze tops from US plastics for peanuts. So I wound up ordering about 25 squeeze tops. And all my finish lives in these bottles because they're impervious to acetone, alcohol, turpentine, whatever. So they work out real well. Well, I never seem to want a great big bottle in my way. So these work out real well. And if, in fact, as sometimes happens, the wipe-on varnish cures in the bottle, just toss the bottle in all. Got plenty more where that came from. If not, the person on your left or right now. <laughs> Did you say U.S. plastics? Mm-hmm. Okay. Is, is go online and order that? I did. There's probably dozens of places that have it. They just happened to be the one that came up when I was hunting for plastic supplies of one kind or another. Are the lids are a specific size, Bob? Um, yeah, and... I worked out the measurement at the time. If anybody's really interested, I'll go ahead and, of course, you have to get your pill bottles from the right location. <laughs> but if you do, uh, I'll be happy to share with you the dimensions. I ordered a bunch of bottles. I think I ordered like 48 of them. The little plastic bottles that are about that tall. They're uh, mm -hmm. almost all white car plastic. But you squeeze them and it has the lid on top of it, you just turn the knob up and so it stays on. And, uh, yeah, I've perfect. seen the flip lids. Where'd you get those? And I've played around with eyedropper types. And I thought they look on the internet, but it wasn't much. It, it probably cost me about $15 for a gripping box of them. The Magmatic Star has got a pretty good selection of 20 tip squeeze bottles. <laughs> John Fabrics in the cake decorating section had little plastic bottles with a thin uh, super glue type tip on it. Mm. And it was a package of four for a couple dollars. That looks kind of ratty. I'm going to clean that off and we'll just wind up with a slightly smaller lid. If you want to overhang at this point, you just make the other part a little smaller. still a chip in it, but it's not as bad. Okay. At this point, I'll part it off in preparation for reversing it. Now, if you don't happen to have a chuck with step jaws, you'll probably have to do a jam chuck because most chucks will not fit inside an inch and a quarter opening. The step jaws will, or you can make a wooden jam chuck. That gets a little fussy though, so we're not gonna do that. my first chuck. It was at the time in the 60s. It's now about $85. Retailed by Penn State, so it's probably available here. Um, it does use Tommy bars, which are not that big an issue. Um, comes with all the same jaws, or did, 
doesn't come with quite all of them now, as the uh, Barracuda II. Uh, the newer ones, I think, only come without the cold jaws. But they do have a number one, two, and three jaw, so that's not bad. Okay, let's trim this down a little bit more. Try to finish it off on the end. At this point, we're going to put a little sanding on it. Um, it's up to you how smooth and pretty you want it. I tend to get carried away sometimes, but you don't have to. I'm going to start with some 180 and just give it a quick touch. As Steve Malat said during his presentation once, if you can't turn a sphere, you can probably sand one. <laughs> That's true, but if you've gotten anywhere near, and when it comes right down to it, spheres are overrated, ovals are pleasing on the eye, and nobody knows whether you did it right. Okay, this is just to, whoops. As you can tell, the step jaws don't grab it that tightly. So once you remove the tailstock, you gotta be a little careful. Uh, but we're not gonna be doing a whole lot. And the shape of this lends itself because you're pressing it in towards the chuck. some color. I could sand this down to 400, but I'm not going to bother. Um, not necessary. I use trans-tint dyes, liquid dyes. I knew I wanted to get into a water-based dye when I first thought about buying dye, and primarily for permanence of color. But then I stumbled across these and I found out, gee, they work with alcohol or water. Uh, I bought black, red, yellow, and blue, and I figure I can do anything from there. A little on the pricey side to get started, but all the guys are. So I mix them up, 
to their prescribed dilution rates. And if I need something a whole lot darker, I do just like Butch does and go straight from the bottle. But because I'm mixing them with water, it gets real easy to blend. The key to blending is keeping it wet. Alcohol tends to dry a little quickly and you can wind up with a hard edge. So I prefer the water for that reason. you want to go around with your fingers colored for the next week. <laughs> Gloves are a good idea. And I only use one on the right because I have a habit of reaching around to stop the lathe. And if you try to stop the lathe with rubber gloves, not only does it wind up the glove and try to take your hand around, uh, the lathe doesn't really stop anyway. And you know that how? <laughs> Practice. 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 <laughs> okay. Always want to start with whatever is your lightest color first. And you can go back even after it's done spun and apply some manually, particularly if you've got rough edges. Okay, so I've got a yellow on here. Any preferences on whether I go with a red, green, orange, whatever? What color scheme appeals to people? Red. What would bring red. that black? You like the red down. on yellow? Yeah. Okay. Um, Presentator's choice. All right, we will go with red. If I can find red, orange. <coughs> One thing to keep handy, bottle of water. Serves two purposes. For one thing, I can keep this wet so that it'll blend easier. And if I don't get the desired blend, I can go back on top of it and use a little bit of water to smear it around. Um, matter of fact, if you get the color a little bit too dark, you can lighten it up often by simply just wiping it down with water. Uh, sometimes you can't, in which case you're going to have to resort to sanding or cutting. Red top or red bottom or both? Bottom, bottom, top, top right. All right, now while it's spinning, it looks nice and smooth. When you stop it, you'll see it's a little bit streaky and blotchy. So now it's time for some water. And we're going to blend this. Is that uh, uh, tap water? Or? Yep. Yeah, I'm too lazy to worry about distilled or anything like that. <laughs> That's a little better. <laughs> Tight grip. Yeah, really. Actually, what it is, I think the wood may be a little damp and it's drying as I'm turning it. And that may be affecting it, or it may be just simply the chuck's getting loose. It's entirely possible the chuck is just vibrating looser. But, okay, so we have some red down here in the core. We can blend that a little bit more if we want by hand without spinning. Um, 
particularly if there's rough areas where the dye didn't get down in there. At 2500 RPM, it doesn't have much chance for the dye to get in and soak in, but you can touch it up a little bit manually. Big thing is keep it wet if you want to blend, otherwise you're liable to get a hard edge. Shall we go with red at the top as well or a different color? There is. Huh? Red. Okay. Now Bob, are you stuck with that red blend as it is down at the bottom? Or couldn't you make the bottom edge darker so it's still? I could probably put some black over it or if I went straight from the bottle, some blue or something. Um, Pre-mixing purple works fine. <coughs> Trying to mix the red and the blue on the piece doesn't work out as well. Okay. Bob, what do so, you have on the bottom edge of the one on the right on the table? Blue. Blue, blue, on blue top or of no? Nah, it looks like purple actually. On top of the red. Yeah, and I think that's what it was. And I could do that here if you like. Anybody want purple on top of it? <coughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. Blue, green, purple. You must take a lot of medicine. Say what? You must take a lot of medicine. <laughs> I have boxes full of these <laughs> bottles. I've been accumulating them for a while. My wife uses some too, so yeah, we have lots of these bottles. Every now and then I tell her, Start saving them again because I'm running low. They're nice for holding screws and stuff, too. Mm hmm. Put a lot of mine on. <laughs> well, if you went to your drugstore, you could probably get the druggist to sell you some at a. However, if you're going to place an order with U.S. plastics to begin with to get the squeeze tops, you might as well get the bottles at the same what time. What size bottles are they? You know? These are 90 and I think 150 milliliters. Nope, that's 200. But I'm pretty sure these are 90. Let's see. Are squeeze bottles? Well, they're flexible. They're flexible. Enough. Yeah, that's a 90, and that's a 200. I'm rotating this by hand to try and get a little bit more build up on here. Once you, once you uh, put the dye in the bottle, will it keep indefinitely? Pretty much. I mean, I mixed these years ago. And I'm still using them. So I haven't had to go back to the original bottles to mix up more. Every now and then I'll go and I'll take some full strength when I want it real dark, but that's about it. Okay, now theoretically I should wait for this to dry. But shellac is alcohol solvent, and alcohol doesn't mind water, it absorbs it. You may get a little bit cloudier finish than you would get if you went and waited. But it's not as soggy as it was. Have you tried blending the uh, colors with the uh, alcohol tint, the alcohol dye? No, I haven't used alcohol mix. I have used the tint in a one pound cut of shellac and sprayed it with an airbrush. This works okay on real small stuff, something the size of a pen, like that. That works. Uh, these birdhouses work. 
I wouldn't try it on an eight inch bowl. It, won't, it wouldn't come out smooth enough to suit me. I mean, if you used a whole lot of water to dilute it, you might get away with it. But generally, I wouldn't. Uh, then I would resort to spraying it pre-mixed in some shellac, and that way you can just control the build, and you get a level of blend and control that you just can't touch doing it by hand. This is Mylan's friction finish. I also have pre-mixed shellac. I've never bothered to get the flake myself. When I first started making flutes, I was using shellac as a finish. And then I re realized, son of a gun, it uses alcohol as a solvent. And if somebody is taking their flute with them to a bar, it's not going to look pretty when they leave. <laughs> so I shifted over to a polyurethane finish on all my flutes. The alcohol in the shellac will help displace the water. It'll just absorb it and it moves. Let's see if we can get a little bit of a shine on here. The friction I'm exerting now will also heat it and help drive off the water. But if you're not in a hurry and trying to finish a presentation in an hour's time, you could let it dry while you do the base or half a dozen other tops or however works for you. This is going to come off a satin finish due to the 220 sanding instead of 400 or 600. So do you usually take them to 600? Usually, I do. Sometimes I'll go further. At one time I tried uh, using the uh, micromesh. Micro and I took the wood all the way through the, all the steps and then I compared it to a piece that I took to 400 and put a friction finish on it. I couldn't tell the difference. So for plastics, sure, take the, all the way with the micro mesh. Wood, no. If, now if you're going to use something like a CA finish that dries hard and has to be sanded down, it'll work bit there. But for something like this, it's a waste of time and effort. <laughs> or tighten the chuck. <laughs> okay, so we have a top. It's not real shiny. I may stick it back up up there a little later and get it uh, a little bit better. Now this block has been drilled to an inch. To get it to fit in that top, I need to turn a tenon on the top of it that's going to run about uh, an inch and a quarter. If it's a hair under, that's okay. If it's bigger, it isn't going to fit. So. That's what we'll shoot for. Um, to do that, since I have already pre-drilled this, I can go between centers. I can stick it in a chuck. Between centers gives me better access, so I'm going to do that this time. If I hadn't drilled it and I was going to drill it on the lathe, then I'd use the chuck, at least initially.
Okay, let's get this thing kind of round. Parting tool, bedan or whatever, and we'll put this tenon on here. I have a set of calipers that I previously set to the size of the bit, but and slightly smaller that I used to drill the hole in the top. So I'm going to use this to check. the size of my tenon. That should be getting awfully close. Uh-oh. I'm undersized. Significantly. Uh, we need a new tenon. <laughs> It's going to be a shorter birdhouse. A nest. That's better. this on a chuck anyway. You can leave the interior straight the way it is now, drilled. What I usually do is hollow it out slightly because I'm going to make an egg-shaped base and an egg-shaped interior makes it that much lighter and more attractive. Is that going to fit this other way? Yeah, that'll fit. You need this other way? No, nah, that'll be all right. Yeah. You're going to blue the roof on? Pardon? Are you going to have the blue on the roof on? Yep. More attractive to who? You? Me. <laughs> and Rich is going to thread it. This is all about what I like and what I want. I'm making it. As long as I'm making it, I get to decide. Right on the way. Where are you going? Got luck, I don't pay it. Now, if I was doing these under contract for somebody, I might be inclined to listen to what they would like. But. Yeah, but. but. How much money you got? <laughs> Not enough, Jerry. You know, you knock out fire still inside there. Yeah, it'll just go round and round. It won't go anywhere. Well, come on in there before it go. What's that rattling noise? I've left the room before. Okay. Plain ordinary round nose scraper. Just need to make sure we stay above center so we don't get grabs. What I'm going to do is just go down to the bottom. I don't want to make it a whole lot deeper. I just want to belly it out some. Um, in fact, I'm going to contour the outside some before I do that, just so that I have something to work to. Okay. 
most of the time, I make my bases real short, which means the perch is sitting in the curve. And that's why I quit making my own perches and just went to using a dowel because you can't put a flange on a perch and have it fit that slope. Um, The beauty of having already bored the side hole is that I can easily look through it to see if the contour is what I'm looking for. It's still a little thick towards the bottom. Happy little bird. Okay. A little more. I like to shoot for about an eighth inch or a little bit less on wall thickness. Beg your pardon? The ones that come to my feeders won't fit. Um, <laughs> You're breathing too well, Bob. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do this between centers so that I can get to the bottom of it. And we'll just do a finial on this. Slop here than we need. It's still here, but maybe it turned. Yeah. That's a little better. the downside of using spalted wood. It's kind of soft, but that'll support it, which will be enough, I think. This is CA. Uh, this happens to be hot stuff. Say what? Is there a split there or something? Yes, there is. When I brought up the tailstock, I hit it a little bit too hard, and if there may have been a crack there before as well, but there certainly is now. Yeah, it's pretty soft. This is some old spalted sweet gum that I harvested in my yard some years ago. We don't want this thing to glue itself in either. Somehow it never works out well <laughs> when we start doing this, but we'll hope. You got in that threaded tape right now. Say what? Okay, that threaded tape. <laughs> That'd be a good thing for it.
it don't apply so much pressure to it. The I mean, problem is it's the type of center it is. All right, we're going to go straight to the chuck. I wasn't going to until I had more meat off of it. Now this one and a quarter is too small for number two jaws. And if you use a step center like this, or step jaws rather, it's really too big. But it's the best option we've got right now since we don't own any jaws designed for an inch and a quarter. If not, you'll catch it, won't you? <laughs> Dick? That right between your teeth. <laughs> as long as that chuck doesn't come off, we all right. <laughs> yeah, I don't think the chuck will go anywhere. Matter of fact, I don't think the piece can go anywhere right now, but. Center, so we're going to go with a new center, one that matches the top. <laughs> yeah, but it matches at the top, and when I get done cutting, the bottom will match too. <laughs> For some reason it didn't work well, it's just wood. You get another piece and start again.
this part's running true now. question is will it stay in the truck when I go to finish off the onion Since no two of these have to match. Uh huh. So much for the check Ooh, holding it. Really gave it Let's see if we can't get these jaws a little tighter. Wow. I'm beginning to think this chuck is opening on its own. Maybe when you go to stop it, you may, may be spinning open. That may be it, or that may in, be exactly what's happening. Maybe it may be time to stop on its own. <laughs> you know, there's something about the. Hey, you going to be waiting to stop it. Not as steady as I'd like. Nope. <laughs> Since this chuck isn't ideally sized to this piece of work, we can pretend. Yeah, we can, but I don't want to have to just sand off the end of this. I'd rather cut it and get it colored. Side Say what? Just get some side cutters. <laughs> well, I could do it with my pen knife, but. Yeah, I think you're down to the pen knife stage. You think? <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> Look at the bright side of it. It doesn't weigh much, so it won't hurt that bad. <laughs> Weighs less now. That time it became two pieces. Yeah. There's one right there. Yeah. That's part of the front. It weighs a lot less now. I'm surprised it made two out of three. <laughs> There's a moral to that story. I, I forgot to preface this demo with the fact that I turn every three or four months, so usually it's a rush job around Christmas time rather than someone who turns every month or every week. We still have all the pieces, but there's a little hole, and the end isn't where we'd like it, so this is less than ideal. That's a good example. When the wood splits, it goes on the burn pile. <laughs> and no, no, it's, it's a good example of things that can go wrong. Yeah. It's not the first time it's happened. Won't be glass either. No. No, we're not going to get much color on this bottom. We can finish the finial off. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> 
didn't bring files, but got a pocket knife. The faceted video adds another five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And carved. Yeah. And carved, yeah. Oh, you have little faith. You don't think I can make it look right, huh? We'll just apply the uh, three foot rule. If it looks okay from three feet away, it's okay. The bird will never know. Okay, we have a finish. <laughs> Now I'm actually going to hit this with some more CA and see if we can't keep the pieces together. Uh, it would at the seam where the glue comes through, sure. But I don't always dye all the pieces. If the if a piece has enough figure to where it's interesting, sometimes I'll leave it natural. So that extra decoration on too, right? Define extra. <laughs> a few extra holes. <laughs> you put the perch anywhere. Do you medium or thin C8? I was using thin for the cracks, but I'll use medium to assemble it. But I'm just debating on whether I want to try remounting this to put a little bit better finish on it. I'm thinking not. medium and I put accelerator on one piece well let's see oh, crap where's the pin knife again it's time for the new supply of CA By the way, this NCF Quick, I don't recommend as a accelerator. It is super mild. I've had better just breathing hard on it. Okay. Let's do some of that out. We got the stick fast. All right, somebody they said here both there. water. Pardon? I heard somebody I heard a thing one day oh, they use yeah. water. Yeah, that will do it. It'll Spray help water. kick it. You can breathe hard on it. Uh, you can use sodium bicarbonate. There's a whole lot of things you can use and get away with. Well, that was what I didn't do. Had I been planning ahead, I would have drilled this on the lathe while it was turning. But all is not lost. We can do this by hand. What's that drill bit is that bottom? This one's about a sixteenth, just glued into a handle of my own making. I also have a smaller one that I use 
for the Don Russell type ornaments where I'm using fish hooks or I'm using light gold loops. Um, and that's commercial little pen vice, pin vice. Mm -hmm. Okay, it has a top, it has a bottom, it is a little disreputable, <laughs> but it is a birdhouse. Um, questions, as far as the finishing, I think that's the primary reason people were interested from everything I heard. What are your favorite colors to use when you're doing the, the dye? My favorites tend to be yellow, orange, red. As you can see over there, I've messed around with a few other colors, but none of them really trip my trigger as well as the yellow-red does. You're talking about the cost of the dye that would be expensive. How much is it for a bottle? Or do you buy a set? Um, I don't know if they have sets. These bottles are about 17 bucks a piece. So I got the three primary colors plus black, and that says I can do any color. If, you, if you're unfamiliar with mixing to achieve colors, pick up a color wheel for a few dollars. They have a couple of different kinds. This one just does all colors. They have some that are designed for wood finishers that focus on all the different tones you may get in wood. Where did you get them? Uh, don't remember where I got them. You can get them from... A variety of places. I might have picked this up at Stone Mountain Power Tools but when we were meeting there years and years ago. Uh, but you can get them in art supplies. You can order them off the internet. Uh, I, tried, I tried to find one for uh, some wood that comes from out in the Denver area. Yeah, like I say, this is primary colors and it's great if you, if you just want to do a color. If you're wanting to match a wood tone, there's another one that they put out that just sticks to the reds, browns in those tints, and it gives you a lot of help there. But you'll get some of it here. As you rotate it, you can get into the reds and browns, and you can get pretty close to some of your wood tones. Hobby Lobby or Michaels might have them too. I don't know. Well, like they 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 well this one is a Stadler. I might have gotten it at uh, Michaels. I know, Don't know. Uh, Highland has those as well as the transcend dyes. Mm -hmm. Did you ever use a powder and mixed up your own? I haven't. And once I got these, I figured there was no point in investing in more. Color wheel from Amazon is $3.74. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> So the cost of getting started <laughs> isn't intimidating. <laughs> For a mere six dollars per. <laughs> you don't want much, do you? No, I don't. Right. The dies, the dies are a little pricey, but I haven't. Well, heck, I use yellow probably more than anything. This is maybe 25% gone, and I've been using these for Christmas ornaments, for birdhouse ornaments, for flutes, and you name it. These so will last me the rest of my life, I'm sure. You said that dye itself is <coughs> with either water or alcohol? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, this is a liquid. The proportion... Uh, do -do 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 -do. One ounce of dye to a quart of water is their recommended mix. And that's what I used when I made these bottles up. If I need a more intense color, I'll use it straight. And Butch, I think you said for that red vase you did, you used the red straight? Straight, about uh, five coats. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. But, you know, it was just wetting a sponge brush and turning it on there. I mean, it's easy. It didn't take much. There's no question about it. It's, it's easy enough to do. Now, Bob, these, these finish, the finish you have on these birdhouses over there, is that the uh, friction polish that you've got? It is. 
but I probably had extra time, sanded them down to 400, let them dry, and then did a friction polish. Because it's just like on a job. pen. Nice when job. I do a friction polish on a pen, it, it comes up nice high gloss. How, when you put it on, you know, how long do you let it dry for you? Do, buff it up or whatever. Don't need to buff it if you're using a friction polish on a pen or something like this. However, you want to give it a couple of days drying time to harden up before you really start using it. If you do a pen with a friction finish and you don't give that finish a chance to really set up before you start assembling the pen, it'll be dulled down by the time you get it all together. So shellac takes a little while to cure it and get all the alcohol and moisture out of it. CA, don't know, I haven't done CA finishes, I think. Ron, you've messed with CA finishes some, and I, some of you others may they, have. They dry right away, and then uh, I use the two different okay. polishes to come with it. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to go to a bunch of sanding steps on it. I don't know that that's a whole lot harder than friction application. You can use it then. There's no way. Yeah, I've tried using it on bowls. And well, bowls are very uh, difficult. Yeah. <laughs> takes a little more CA. Yeah, you know who talked me into that one. Um, no, uh, we went down to his shop for the class. Yeah, Mark got in. Yeah, he was doing it on vessels and hollow forms, and I figured, oh well. I was doing this uh, cherry burl hollow form, and then I did a cherry burl uh, bowl. And since I was having to use the CA anyway to harden up the soft parts and the bark, I figured it'll match. It was half done anyway, huh? So I just added a lot more CA and a little sanding. And You're buying quartz? <laughs> No, that's one of the reasons I don't use CA as a finish, generally. I mean, shellac's dirt cheap. And they've been using it since the beginning of time. And if the kid gets a hold of it and starts gnawing on it, it's safe. Of course, they say once say CA is cured, it's safe as well. So either way. So I hope you have learned something about applying dyes the low-tech way. Um, doesn't take a whole lot of sophistication. And if you start with good solid wood, life is a whole lot easier. <laughs> if you want to use highly figured spalted woods, you're running things a little risky. So you like the fritz and finish on that sort of thing as much as anything? Yeah, because it's, it's quick and easy. darn easy to put on. Yeah, it, it's super simple. Goes quickly and easily. So what's your favorite wood for doing these? Fog. Whatever's laying around Free. the basement. Yeah. <laughs> Free. <laughs> you prefer a light color? Yeah, you, you want something light because obviously walnut isn't going to die up real well. So I've used Bradford pear because I had lots of that. I used sweet gum because I had lots of that. Um, I'm sure if you happen to have some chunks of basswood or poplar or whatever, as long as the poplar isn't too green, that'll work as well. Green poplar is eventually going to be brown, but it takes a while. Yeah, we may never see it. <laughs> I, know, I've, I did a flute out of poplar that had green streaks down the sides. And I thought, that's neat. I wonder how long it'll take. And it finally has gone brown. It's a brownish green, but it's brown. <laughs> so a few years later. Yeah. Well, that's good about it.